Zoom. Uh, everybody is muted. Uh, if you're new to us and have not used Zoom's chat feature, uh, briefly just mouse over the screen. You're going to see menus appear at the bottom. There's a chat window, open it up. Uh, there's an important detail I want to tell you about because when you pull that up, the default is to send the chat question to everyone. However, tonight, uh, don't pick that. Uh, please instead select Mike Shear, send your Shear and send your questions to him. Uh, Mike will read through the questions uh, and he will read those first and Angela will answer those. Now, if we have time, and that's not always the case, then Mike will read the questions that get sent to everyone. So if you want to make sure your question gets answered, please send it to Mike Shear. Okay, now I would like to introduce Cynthia Blankenship, who will introduce uh, Angela. Uh, Cynthia is on the board of the Geologists of Jackson Hole. Uh, she is the secretary. She's the communications director. She's also famous for her Tuesday presentations and just a very nice person. Without further ado, Cynthia, would you please take this away? Got it. Thank you, Brent. As I always say, flattery will get you everywhere. So um, just a quick update, actually. Uh, as a communications director, one of the things I do is, is um, correspond with Leah Schlechter, who's our liaison at the library. She works for the library. And I communicated with her recently because there are some events going on at the library, um, but they're not in the auditorium. So uh, they're uh, in the fireside area of the library. In the auditorium, what they have is they've got one side of the auditorium that is, is storage for extra tables that they had to take away to reduce spacing for COVID. And the other side is open, but it can only hold 10 people. That's their maximum, while Teton County is still in the, in the red for COVID. So it doesn't look like there's gonna be any change very soon, especially not if we stay in the red. And so that's the story with the library. Um, and as you know, the geologist of Jackson Hole has a longstanding partnership with the library and also the library foundation. And we are part of the Science and Nature Tuesday evening programs that usually take place in the library. Recently, we've been really thankful to be able to use St. John's Episcopal Church to host our live events, where we have um, we can do both live and simulcast via Zoom. So huge thanks to St. John's um, in the meantime until we can get back to the library. Okay, so let me then introduce our speaker for tonight, Angela Reddick. Angela is a paleontologist and education director at the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, where she started working about 10 years ago. And she has had numerous roles there, including dig for a day host, excavation manager, pre preparator, and most recently education director for the museum. Angela, I, that, I think this is a typo. I think it must be prepare, but maybe Angela can correct me on that one. Anyway, Angela received her master's degree in geology from Northern Illinois University and two bachelor's degrees from the University of Tennessee and Mar Martin. One of those was in geology and the other was in mathematics. And she specializes in Jurassic theropod statistical analyses using bone measurements to determine social distributions among well-known Morrison Formation bone beds. Recently, she has been working to expand the Wyoming Dinosaur Center's internship and educational programs. Um, maybe this talk will count toward expanding the educational programs. <clears throat> Sorry, Angela is also researching the implied behavioral characteristics of Allosaurus found in the Warm Springs Ranch of Thermopolis and population distributions of Mayasaura from a quarry in Southern Montana. <coughs> Sorry. Tonight, she will be talking to us about the Cleveland Lloyd dinosaur quarry, quarry, Allosaurus assemblage, predator pitfall or coincidence. So I'm sure it's going to be an absolutely outstanding talk. Thank you again, Angela. And sorry you couldn't make it over here because of the weather. Um, but we will have you visiting us here in Jackson Hall one of these years, um, hopefully after COVID as well. So take it away, Angela. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. 
um, I'll go ahead and share my screen for my presentation. Um, so a little bit back over my introduction. Um, so it is pronounced a uh, preparator. So specifically working in the prep lab for a couple years, I was very experienced in cleaning bones for eight hours a day, five days a week. You get very monotonous, but it's, it's the kind of OCD kind of work that I, I like to do a lot. So well, thank that you was, for that uh, clarification. Yeah. Yeah, apparently though, preparator actually is a title for anyone that prepares any kind of historical, like documents, things like that, uh, pictures, um, paintings could be called a preparator. Um, but yeah, I, I did, uh, before I really started running the dig sites and then became education director, I was just a preparator in the lab um, all the time. <laughs> Okay, so um, to start my presentation, um, mentioned before, I do have two bachelor's degrees in geology and mathematics um, from my hometown in Tennessee. And because of those, my uh, master's thesis, which is what this presentation is mainly on, makes a little bit more sense. Um, I spent a lot of time taking statistics and math courses and honestly, before I got into really into paleontology, I always knew I was going to do something with math. Um, geology just kind of gave me an outlet for uh, the, the, my interest in math and a practical application to it. Um, so just to show you, I, you heard the title of the presentation, and everything like that. But the original title for uh, this presentation was much longer. <laughs> And this is actually the title of my thesis as well. So all in all, I was looking at a bone bed in Utah, looking at Allosaurus fragilis, um, the, one of the largest um, theropod predatory dinosaurs found in, those, in that dig site, um, and actually statistically compared them to bones of the largest, one of the largest predators um, at the La Brea Tar Pits in um, California. So two very different locales considering I grew up in Tennessee, went to grad school in Illinois, have worked in Wyoming repeatedly, and then I'm gonna study in Utah and California because why not throw everything all over the place? Um, but my more liked title for this presentation that didn't wasn't too as much of a mouthful um, was CLDQ, so Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, um, Allosaurus assemblage. Is it a predator pitfall um, or a coincidental catastrophe um, in that situation? Um, so here showing again um, my two localities, the main one being the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. I spent two part of two summers there working with a group actually based out of Wisconsin. Um, which is pretty interesting because they got the permissions to work at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry um, and further excavate, further uh, prospect, looking around the areas, following their trails, finding new bones, new sites. Um, it's estimated that from this one quarry, there's been around 12,000 bones found. Um, in comparison, the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, we have our own property with uh, dig sites on them. We have upwards of 130 different dig sites, depending on who you ask, but our most densely packed uh, dig site has only this year, so that'd be about 25, 26 years active dig site, worked every single day during the summer for four months, has only produced just over 2,000 bones. So in comparison, this one dig site in Utah has produced six times that amount. Um, which is kind of crazy. Um, this is actually located south of Price, Utah. In Price, they actually have a Cleveland Lloyd um, visitor center there, um, but the visitor center in uh, actually at the dig site, which you can see, let me see, this, yeah, this picture, 
Um, they have a, uh, a visitor center right near the dig site, um, which is a, a nice little building. It's free to go to. Um, you do have to travel for about an hour on dirt roads, which isn't terribly unusual for people from Wyoming. Um, for me, coming from back east in Tennessee, uh, that much bentonite roads was a bit of a uh, surprise and a shocker for me. I wasn't used to dirt and gravel roads that much. Um, most of our roads, even our back roads, are pretty much paved all the time. Um, but the dig site itself is located behind the uh, the property, or sorry, the visitor center um, in the two buildings, two white buildings you can kind of see on the right side of the screen. And uh, the right far right hand building is where the original site, or as much of left of the original site, is still housed and covered. Um, with bones still preserved there, um, either waiting to be excavated or more, more so leaving them in place um, to be able to show off to visitors that come to see the property. Um, the other building, which is actually where we were mainly working when I was there a couple summers, uh, we didn't find much bone. We were actually mainly doing uh, overburden removal, just removing a very thick limestone layer that they have. Um, inside that building that they had to get through to get to the other bone bed. So we're trying to expand the existing bone bed, the known about bone bed, um, and see if it continues in uh, that direction um, of the second building, which would be convenient. Um, but there was so much overburden in those two summers and the time that we spent there, we never did actually get to that bone bed layer. They were still working on it when I, when I uh, left the last time. Um, my other locality, was of course in the middle of Los Angeles um, at the La Brea Tar Pits. So the, the Page Museum hosted me there for about a week um, to study all of the bones found from Cleveland Lo Lloyd, or most of them. Most of them are housed at the Natural History Museum in Salt Lake City. I only had to be there for about three days. And I actually looked at a couple different types of animals. I looked at the Allosaurus mainly, but a previous project I had worked on um, was dealing with a dinosaur called Ceratosaurus. So I looked at their specimen at Salt Lake too. So that took me three days to look at only the femurs, only the femora from the uh, dire wolves at La Brea Tar Pits. Took me a full week. There were so many bones. Um, had to look at all of them, get all these measurements. And I'll go through that a little bit more specifically. Um, but considering roughly three days in Salt Lake versus a full week, you can kind of tell the discrepancy in the number of bones I looked at at each dig site. Um, so to start this out, we're talking about is Cleveland Lloyd, is this dinosaur quarry a predator trap? Um, the best known predator trap is the La Brea Tar Pits, hence why I studied there, looked at those bones, and we're comparing things. Um, but what really makes a predator trap? What makes the La Brea Tar Pit such a good example of a predator trap? Um, and specifically in most cases, um, but very pertinent to this locality in California, is that there has to be something for the animals to get stuck in. So a naturally sticky or viscous material, something um, like a mud layer or more uh, in, in the case of the tar pits, tar, warm or semi-viscous uh, asphalt, basically. Um, and pretty much an animal wanders into this area unknowingly, probably looking for water or possibly like stepping into quicksand, don't even realize it's there. They step in there and they are stuck. They can't get out. They start to struggle. They start to stick more. They get even more trapped. Um, they start to cry out um, in distress, and because of that, you get predators that come in. You get things, oh, oh, there's, a, there's an animal stuck here, and they're here, and they're struggling. This is an easy meal. This, this would be something good. I'm not going to have to fight to get this. I just got to kill it, and it's dead, and I can eat it. The issue is when they go there to get the animal that's stuck, they then become stuck. So it kind of makes a vicious cycle because once they become stuck, they struggle, they start to cry out, get the attention of other animals, 
other predators, bring more animals in, and it just keeps going. Um, the La Brea tar pits, um, or La Rancho La Brea, as it's also known, was made up of this sandy clay layer that was soaked in asphalt. So it's very sticky. Um, they actually told me while I was there that they see animals still getting stuck in the um, open pits um, to this day, as much as they have them fenced off and protected so that people, if nothing else, doesn't wander in. Uh, and uh, larger animals like dogs or people's cats don't wander in, they'll still occasionally get a bird or a squirrel or something or a rabbit gets stuck in there. And um, I'm sure they do their best to try and get them out, but there's only so much you can do sometimes. Um, these, most of these um, were deposited later in the, in the Pleistocene around um, 55,000 years ago. Um, but they have been active up until today, like I was saying, with the, uh, with the current animals getting stuck in there. Um, because of that, this is one of the most active, most studied, most accessible dig sites in the world. Um, and it has become the poster child for a predator trap. There is an easily countable 10 to 1 predator, carnivore, wolves, cats, bears, all these kinds of things um, versus the prey animals found in this um, in these pits that they have. Um, easily thousands of bones available to look at um, for anyone that's interested in doing research or anything there. Um, they're also very accommodating. They were extremely nice um, to me while I was there and uh, it's just very nice to work with them. So oh, good, good example of uh, the animal struggling. You see one one prey item, one poor mammoth that got stuck first, and then all the predators that are getting stuck around them. Uh, not the best situation to be in. Um, good example here, uh, pictures from their visitor center. Um, they have so many things on display, so many different um, predators, uh, modern gray wolves, mammoths, mastodons, um, smile it on other large cats. Um, the dire wolves were mainly what I was looking at, um, but they also had like short faced bears, birds, um, tons of smaller animals. Um, but the main, the main concentration that they had more animals of this than anything else, um, were the dire wolves, um, which is mainly why I was looking at them. Um, a good image of one of their, their pits. So the bones, the co coolest thing about their bones, they are still original bone material. They have not been fossilized. They've not been petrified. They've not been replaced with anything. They are the original soft, relatively soft, considering their bone um, material found in the same types of uh, organic material that animals have in their bones today. Nothing has been replaced. They have just typically been stained, um, either a brownish or black color um, due to the tar, um, but nothing has been replaced. They're not like uh, the dinosaur bones we deal with on a regular basis that are exceptionally heavy because they've been entirely replaced with rock and minerals. These are still just as light as a modern bone would be. Um, the Clevelandoid quarry, again, outside of Price, Utah, um, is known for how many bones there are. I mentioned there are 12,000 in this one dig site. Um, they're from the Morrison Formation, which is my most familiar formation. I worked in the Morrison Formation um, actually since undergraduate. Um, one of the first places we really did um, venturing out of Tennessee was to Colorado, where we looked specifically at the Morrison Formation. Uh, not specifically the brushy, brushy basin member, just because we were looking at it more from a stratigraphy point of view. So we were looking at a bunch of different members. Um, but the Morrison Formation, I have more or less not stopped looking at since undergrad, into work, back to grad school, and uh, into work again out here at the Dinosaur Center. Um, it's actually about the same age as what we dig here, right around 150 million years old pretty much all mudstone. 
there's very little difference between what they find there in Utah and what we find here, other than they have a massive uh, abundance of predators, massive abundance of Allosaurus and other me, uh, theropod dinosaurs. We have a massive abundance of sauropods. We get Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus. So I've kind of shifted a little bit from looking mainly at the theropods and the allosaurus to more looking at the uh, sauropods now. Um, but still very similar, very similar environment. Um, the issue is why in the world do we find all the prey items and a very low concentration of predators here when they're in Utah, they find a massive abundance of predators and a very low abundance of prey. Um, also, most of these specimens are not pretty and articulated. They're not all laid out nicely or anything like that. Um, nothing perfectly aligned uh, the way you would expect to say, yes, all these bones belong to one animal. No, there's, there's piles of bones. There's um, a foot beside a leg, beside the arm, next to the neck, next to a skull, all these jumbled things, um, which actually is very similar to kind of how um, the La Brea Tar Pits was distributed as well. So, of course, I've got to show all of my dinosaur pictures. Um, the, you'll see there's quite a few different ones here, but predominated by um, the Allosaurus. There's also other therapo theropods like Stoxosaurus, uh, Ceratosaurus, which I was talking about before. They actually had the largest species of uh, Ceratosaurus um, so far found was at the uh, Cleveland Lord Quarry. I saw this skull. It was huge, like absolutely massive, far larger than they would have expected Ceratosaurus to be, um, as well as uh, Torvosaurus and a, a few others, but again, predominated by Allosaurus, so many more Allosaurus than anything else there. And then of course they do have a few random turtles, uh, more uh, of your, so a few of your sauropods, Stegosaurus, things like that. So you do have a few um, prey items, but easily four times as many predators and almost specifically, almost exclusively four times as many allosaurs as just about anything else in the dig site itself. Um, like I said, pretty allosaurus, larger, well, sorry, smaller than T-Rex, but larger arms. So makes him special in my opinion. Now I will say this, when I was writing my thesis, this was the most difficult, most time-consuming process. This was the part of the process that my advisors and everyone just kept telling me, we need more. We need more evidence. We need more things backing this up. We need as much information as possible in order to officially be able to compare Canistyrus, a mammal, from the late Pleistocene to an allosaurus, a dinosaur, a reptile, bird relative from the late uh, Jurassic. Why in the world would you think this quadrupedal wolf should be compared to a bipedal dinosaur that we don't even completely understand how dinosaurs behave because we thought they were slow moving, sluggish, uh, vicious predators? Um, but now we're starting to think they might be more similar to birds or something like that. Just why in the world would you want to compare this to this? It just, it was so hard. <laughs> more, it took more time than anything. I had the statistics done and finished relatively quickly, but it took more time than anything to get this written up and get this fully researched as much as I could possibly get. And I basically had to look into so much. I had to look at their morphology. How, what are their body types? Why would I compare a quadruped to a biped? That kind of stuff. Um, how are their skulls built? Um, what are their teeth like? What are their average lifespans? Um, what's their distribution? I had to look at geology, paleontology, um, ecology, behavioral morphology, comparative morphology, um, all these different things to say, okay, even though on the surface, they look unbelievably different. 
they actually have a lot of things in common. A few of the things that they had most in common were the fact that if nothing else, they were found in the highest abundance, in the highest concentration at these two dig sites. Um, there were, I believe, 46 specimens of Allosaurus fragilis found at uh, the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. And that's mainly based off of the, the femora, um, the femurs that they found. Um, in comparison, there were over a thousand dire wolf femurs um, that I ended up looking at. Neither are the largest predator at their respective um, pits, basically. Uh, Torvosaurus was much larger than Allosaurus, but there was only, I think, one of those that was actually found. And uh, Smilodon is much larger than a dire wolf. And then, of course, you've got the short faced bear and other bears that were there as well that would have been larger. Um, but based on that, if nothing else, made me think, okay, maybe we can compare these in these cases. Um, talking about the kinds of animals that they hunted, both tended to go towards animals that were larger, uh, significantly larger on average than they were. Um, dire wolves focused on uh, bisons and mammoths and things like that, whereas uh, Allosaurus would look more at the large sauropods. Um, we do have evidence of uh, specimens here and other specimens that they would go for stegosaurs and some smaller prey sometimes, but um, definite major evidence that they would go after the sauropods as well. Um, it's very likely they had both had very good sense of smells, um, hinted that both could migrate following their prey and that kind of stuff. Um, it's not for sure known if Allosaurus would deal with um, living in groups or pack situations, um, though there is some evidence to support that. We have some evidence uh, to support that on uh, in our dig sites, and I'll actually talk about that later on with a little bit more of the, the more recent research I've been working on. Um, so there were so many different things that I had to look at to say, okay, we can compare these two things. Now let's see if we think that these guys are similar enough, if we think that they behaved in similar enough fashion, can we? base the statistics? Can we base the numbers of animals, the size of these animals, the distribution of these animals in each of these localities to say, is the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry the same situation as the La Brea Tar Pits, or is it conceivably different? Um, my methods were actually pretty basic. I didn't do too much new, innovative, or anything like that. I used a measuring tape and I used a caliper. Um, so each bone from each dig site, I unfortunately didn't take any pictures of us measuring with a giant caliper um, at the Salt Lake City Museum, but we did measure as accurately as possible the length of each of the Allosaurus femurs that we looked at. Um, we looked at, I believe it was 35. Allosaurus femora, and then got measurements for an additional 10 or so from a previous paper. So we looked at uh, all the numbers, we had all the recorded numbers and everything like that, and then looked back in literature and found uh, bones that had been transported to other sites and other localities that were not at this museum anymore, uh, a paper by Marsh, and looked at his measurements of these same bones in the same way. Um, we got the length and then we got the circumference. So I say width in this picture, but it was actually the, the circumference um, around the mid shaft. So measured to the middle point of the bone and uh, got that circumference measurement. Um, we then did the same thing um, for the Canis iris, the dire wolf bones. Um, there, of course, was some discrepancy. We did have to make a few adjustments um, because the Allosaurus bones could often be taphonomically bent or crooked and things like that. Some were missing portions. Um, so we typically left those out or based on these width and their proportions, were able to adjust to those measurements to say, while it is missing this much, we can say it roughly should be this size in comparison to the others um, that were present. 
um, that can easily skew your data because you're using what you're measuring to base what you're newly measuring off of and then putting it all together. So that can easily skew your data. So I had to run multiple tests with the data adjusted as well as not adjusted, just based on what we actually had at the time. Um, there was another thing we had to account for when we were dealing with the Dara Wolf bones in the fact that you can actually see on this one, there's a line here. So that is where the end of the bone, the uh, epiphysis, has fused to the main shaft of the bone. If the animal is too young, this won't be fused yet. And sometimes in slightly older or larger animals, it may not fuse anyway. Um, it usually does, but doesn't always. So there were a decent amount of bones that we had that did not have this epiphysis, um, either the uh, proximal or the distal epiphysis, or just one missing. So we had to take into account what is the length? What does this epiphysis add on to the overall length um, of our bones? Um, and adjust based on what's missing, what's not missing. How do we account for that? I did a lot of ratios, um, but again, we're, we're estimating that these can easily skew your data. Um, so we did do a lot of stuff with adjusting these bones, adjusting the, the Cleveland Lloyd bones, not adjusting either, only adjusting one back and forth. So many graphs, all the graphs. Um, of course, as you can see here, um, I actually showed one of my coworkers this, and he's like, I love that you used spreadsheets to talk about all the spreadsheets that you had to do. And these actually are spreadsheets that I created. This is my actual data used as a background image um, for uh, this slide. Um, so overall, I looked at more than 1,100 bones. So many bones. Um, so yeah, I had my numbers slightly off. There were 66 total femurs, femora, from Cleveland Lloyd. We only looked at, I think it was, I think it was the 46 number. Um, but there were over 1,000 from the Labrea Tarpets. So to abbreviate, make it a little bit easier, LBTPs, Labrea Tarpets, CLDQs, Cleveland Lloyd. Um, and at Cleveland Lloyd, it's all one dig site. Everything is combined into one, uh, one dig site. But at the Labrea Tarpets, they're from multiple different pits. They don't even call them dig sites. They're, they're just pits. Um, they had eight different pits, all with different numbers. Um, and then one group, I had to make it a combined pit, not available because they didn't have numbers because these bones were retrieved years before they actually started their specific numbering and collecting scheme. Um, even looking back at our stuff now, we don't do the same method of collecting and numbering bones now as we did in the past. So it has changed when they originally found stuff. I'm sure they were just digging stuff up to get it out of the way or nothing else to sell it to try and get rid of the stuff. Um, so they didn't record things. When it became historically important, that's when they started um, recording things. So once we had all these values, once we had all our measurements, um, I did a ratio. I did a ratio of the um, length versus the circumference. So that in that way, you can have a one single measurement for each individual bone instead of comparing two, because um, you might have a more stocky individual, you might have a more lean individual, um, you might have someone, honestly, a comparison of a wrestler or a heavy power lifter, someone that's, that's built very uh, relatively short and stocky versus a long distance runner who's built more uh, lean, longer limbs typically and all that kind of stuff, a, a runner versus a, a wrestler or something like that. Um, and by taking that um, circumference versus length measurement, you can kind of uh, standardize um, that a little bit. Um, in our case, because you don't have dinosaurs and wolves that are becoming power lifters, you don't have quite as much discrepancy among sizes of of the probably thousands of these animals that were running around versus the millions of humans that are running around. Um, you can, to some extent, estimate age based on these measurements. 
um, which was our main goal in doing this. I then went through and used um, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. I had to practice that many times to make sure I pronounced it correctly. Um, to compare the distributions, I originally made the mistake of only remembering my basic statistics and compared the average size of these animals. And that was not what I needed to do. And I was really excited. I finished all that. And then I sent the, the, the information out to um, a woman that is very helpful, but also very blunt. And she basically told me, this is ridiculous and you're completely wrong. You need to do this test instead. So I learned from my mistakes. Uh, I performed the correct test the second time I was going through it um, to compare the Cleveland Lloyd bones, their standardized values, to the La Brea Tar Pits bones. And I did this in a very, as much of a meticulous way as I could and compared the overall Cleveland Lloyd bones because they were found at one dig site to each individual pit from the La Brea Tar Pits then compared them both overall. And this was also done for the adjusted values and the unadjusted values. So overall, these are my two distributions for Allosaurus fragilis. Um, the measured links are in the top left, and that shows you what we actually measured out of the values versus the adjusted um, uh, values based on adding in, uh, I think I said Marks before I meant Madsen, um, his measurements, as well as anything that we had to adjust um, the links of. So there's a little bit more of an expected closer to standard distribution um, for the adjusted values, um, which isn't unexpected, um, kind of what we were looking for. Um, and then we have here, um, the same kind of things, just the, the femur links, the links of these bones um, for the Canis iris. And you can kind of see the original measurements, what we exactly what we measured um, in figure 7a versus the adjusted links. So that means we're adding on these additional measurements for the missing epiphyses um, on each end of the bone. Um, which, of course, as you can see here, has kind of skewed the data a little bit more to the high end because, of course, you're measuring a smaller value and then you're adding extra length onto it by adjusting um, for the, uh, the missing chunks of bone, pretty much. Now, these, this is why there's so many different graphs. Um, these are just two of the graphs I used. One is typical pit three. On the top left, that was a very typical pit measurement. Um, you had much fewer of the smaller ones, much more of larger sized ones. It was very much a skewed measurement. In comparison, when you look at the pit in A, the pit that didn't have uh, a pit number or locality or anything like that, that gives you a much odder distribution of bones. Um, shows you that uh, there, there may be something different going on here. They're not all from the same site. Uh, potentially, if you had taken out each individual pit where these were originally collected from, it might have all been uh, uh, look like pit three measurements, um, but we don't know that. We, we can't go back and say, okay, let's put these bones back where they came from and then take them out again and do better recording. You just can't do that. Um, so. This is, this is the best we got. So this was my hypothesis. This was the overall hypothesis, the statistically based hypothesis comparing um, Cleveland Lloyd to um, the La Brea Tar Pits and what I was looking for. I show this just because this can get confusing. Whoops. But in comparison, my actual in words hypothesis, I was looking at both a null and alternative. You always have those when you're doing it. Um, in this case, my null says that these two quarries are the same. They're both predator traps. We know Clay, we know La Brea Tar Pits is a predator trap. We think Cleveland Lloyd is also a predator trap. So that's our null. That is that is what we're we're 
honestly, that's what we were kind of wanting to see if it was true. But you always have to have your alternative be unequal in some way, either greater than, less than. In this case, we didn't know. We didn't know if one would be larger, one would be smaller. Um, all we knew is what we thought they shouldn't match. Either they would match or they wouldn't match. And that's the hypothesis we were testing with all of the, the fun data on the previous slide. So once again, more graphs. Um, comparing using um, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, um, we were able to create these two graphs and compare Allosaurus versus the dire wolf distribution. Um, you can tell there's a definite difference in the way these graph to these two lines look. The Allosaurus is much more stair step, the wolf is much more smooth, and that's pretty much just because there was a much higher population of uh, dire wolf than there were of Allosaurus. Um, and that's where, where this kind of kind of differs a little bit. Um, so in all the different cases, there were many different cases. I think I ran like 11 different cases um, based on these things. Um, we're looking for that small P value. We, we were looking for that small value um, because that tells us that we reject um, the null hypothesis. These pits aren't the same. They're not behaving the same way. The distribution isn't the same, um, which was kind of what we were leaning towards, what we were kind of expecting to be the case. Um, the issue ended up coming up later on, um, but you can see that we do have multiple cases, um, all this kind of stuff, um, but we, we, we ran into a, a little bit of an issue and it mainly revolved around this pit in a, every single pit that we had uh, for uh, the Cleveland Lloyd, sorry, for the La Brea Tar Pits um, said that the distributions didn't match. When you threw in uh, the pit in A, all those random bones from all over the place, it said that they did match. Um, we even went so far as to just compare the proportion of what we measured to be juveniles versus what we measured to be adults. When we did the proportionary test, it said they didn't match. Again, didn't match at all. Um, but that pit NA threw everything for a loop. When you compare that pit to all of Cleveland Lloyd, when you put all of the Labrador pits together and compared it to Cleveland Lloyd, they they seem the same. It, 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 it threw everything off. It just, you basically have individual things that are telling you one thing and you have the overall distribution telling you something else. And this is what's called the Simpsons paradox. When there are individual pieces that say one thing, and overall it says something completely different, literally the opposite, it, it throws things off. Um, it basically means there's something that hasn't been accounted for. So as much as I went through the trouble of saying, yes, you can compare these two animals, they're similar enough that they can be compared, that you can do um, this type of study with them, there's some measurement we're missing. Um, there's something that isn't right. There's something that's throwing off um, these values. Um, so honestly, when that came up and I had to tell my advisors that this happened, my first thought was, oh no, I'm gonna have to restart my thesis again because this was actually my second project and I had to restart at some point. I'm like, no, I don't wanna restart again. I've been doing this for three years. I don't wanna restart again. Luckily, they're like, no, it's okay. Just because this happens doesn't mean we didn't lose, uh, didn't gain some kind of knowledge. Um, it does appear, and based on my research and everything, it does seem that in similar situations, Allosaurus and dire wolves very likely could have behaved in similar manners, um, given a uh, predator trap situation and sticky mud that would have been for the allosaurus or asphalt for the wolves, they likely could have been in these pack groups in these family structures and added all those numbers in there. Um, but Cleveland Lloyd may not be a predator trap. 
um, there's a decent chance thinking about uh, migration patterns of these large animals, um, the geology of this uh, area, that these could be a seasonal accumulation where uh, La Brea Tar Pits was one steady event, roughly, there are dry and wet seasons going out throughout Utah and uh, Colorado and Wyoming and all these areas where the Morrison Formation is found. There was very much a wet and dry season. So these animals may have been crowded around a single source of water to stay at this pit instead of being attracted by dying uh, prey items. They were there because they were staying for water. If you have a group of allosaurs hanging around the last source of water, not even a very desperate sauropod is going to typically go by that um, source of water. They'll keep going. They'll, they'll have a better storage system or larger animals. They'll keep going. They'll, they'll find water some other way. Um, so there is a good bit of evidence to support um, through others studies that these could be a seasonal accumulation. That's why we wanted to compare and make a final say so, yes or no, is this a predator trap or not? Because um, that would help others looking at this pit going forward. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't do that. It, it didn't really work. Um, I'd love to say that every time you do some kind of science, you get a very nice, clear, or at least not completely contradictory answer um, to things, but it just, it, it doesn't always happen. And it didn't happen in my case. Um, eventually, what I'd like to go do is actually return to the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, we used size of these femurs um, because it's the largest bone. It's typically the most proportionate to the size of the animal, age of the animal, um, to compare um, these animals. The issue is it didn't really work. Um, it might be a better estimate to figure out what their weights were, what their weight distribution of is. Um, typically, heavier animals are older animals. You have younger animals are much lighter. Um, we can already do that with the Allosaurus bones because they're bipeds. Um, you can't easily do that just from the femurs. Um, however, for quadrupeds, you also need to measure, um, take a few similar measurements for the, the humeri. We need to look at their, their upper arms, their forelegs, um, to look at those. Then once again, we'll go through the same test, the same distribution of over 1,100 bones, run all these tests, and put them together. Um, maybe that will give us more conclusive evidence. Maybe that will be the measurement, what we're missing in our Simpsons paradox. And maybe it won't be. Um, eventually, I do want to, especially with all this data, I, I want it to be available to the general public so, or if nothing else to the scientific community so that they can see these. So not as many other people have to go back and measure 1,100 bones. Um, they can actually say, oh, we just need to look at these bones from the Allosaurus at the Cleveland Lloyd. We need to look at this one specifically. They can find it that way. Um, it hasn't happened yet. Um, I've been a little distracted and have yet to get this data out other than what I defended and presented for my master's thesis. Um, of course, all of my general acknowledgements, this is a, a slightly older presentation, but there were a lot of people that helped out with this, including my uh, uh, advisors um, from multiple schools, um, people at the Natural History Museum in Utah, people at the Page Museum, um, a couple of my advisors here actually um, got in touch with a woman, uh, uh, Judy Masari uh, and Bill Wall. They actually are more focused in marine reptiles, um, but they were nice enough to help me out. Um, Dr. Masari has worked with biostatistics for a very long time. And while I've done statistics, I hadn't done much biostatistics. So she helped me out. She was the nice one to tell me when I was completely wrong and had to redo all of my uh, statistical analyses, which works fine. Um, and then of course, uh, my husband, Eric Evenson, um, went along with me for all these measuring trips into the, the Cleveland Lloyd site and out to California and all that kind of fun stuff. So he was very helpful with all that. Um, but the main, the main reason none of this has been published um, is because I have been a bit distracted. More recently, I have been working here, working with the programs. I'll show you all some pictures in a minute. Um, but 
like I said, we're looking at some allosaurus behavioral things kind of here, at least, at least a little bit. Um, we have a dig site that we do a dig site tour at every single day during the summer called the Something Interesting Quarry. Um, we're very original with our names for those of you that haven't been here before. Um, but we have the Something Interesting Quarry, and it is our most interesting dig site. It has bones and it has footprints, and it is a behavioral gold mine of what allosaurs might have been doing without ever having any allosaurus bone. Um, we have allosaurus footprints, we have sauropod footprints, and we have hundreds of allosaurus teeth. Um, so this dig site is the only confirmed allosaurus feeding site in the world. And it implies that old allosaurs, young allosaurs, middle-aged allosaurs, all of the above came into this area and fed on one or two animals. They just kept coming back to this area, all different sizes. We find baby teeth, we find adult teeth, all this kind of stuff says that they were here and there's a very good chance because of that, that they were at least for a time, if not regularly, associating in groups or packs. So that's one line of evidence. Um, what I've been looking at a little bit more recently um, is another dig site very close to that one called Cheryl's Blind, um, mainly because Cheryl didn't see a bone one time and accidentally destroyed it. Um, again, very original with our dig site names. Um, and originally that dig site was a sauropod site, but later realized it's actually got 70% of an allosaurus there, as well as a second individual, much less complete. But there are a couple bones in this dig site that are very unique. Um, they're very, very odd. Um, they come from the same animal. They're found right near each other. Um, and they're actually from the leg. So not like an arm or a back injury or anything like that. They are a leg injury. Um, and again, these guys are bipeds. So leg injuries uh, just don't go so well. Um, so I actually, hopefully y'all can see well enough. I have a fibula. This is a cast. Um, we ran out of white plastic, so we had to use red plastic for a bit of it. But this is what a normal fibula looks like from an allosaurus. This is actually a 3D printed fibula from this 70% complete allosaurus from Cheryl's Blind. The other fibula, though, looks like this. And this is all of it. It was not weathered away. It was not just missing or broken off and later destroyed. This is the whole bone. This is all of it. It's missing easily two thirds, if not three quarters, of this bone. Um, you can also see in this middle section here, it's a bit gnarly. It's kind of kind of fat. Doesn't look right. So this is not what a bone is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be very smooth on both the top and the bottom, and it's just very gnarly in there. Um, the picture that you're seeing on the screen is actually a cat scan. So it's inside pretty much this part of the bone, cut right through there. Um, they're nice enough at the hospital in town to actually give access to the CAT scan. And we were able to look inside this bone and it's definitely injury, most likely a bite that we've never found a tooth, um, but it was definitely an injury. It was definitely painful, definitely oozing, and it definitely healed at least partially. Um, we also have the tibia. It's a little bit too heavy. I can't pick it up right at this moment. Um, but it has this gnarly swollen section of it as well. And the only reason it's swollen is because it healed. Now imagine large, massive bipedal carnivore wandering around with a severely injured, severely broken leg, potentially missing almost half of his lower leg. He's not doing good. The only at this point, the only feasible way that we can think of that he would have survived is if he or she was being taken care of at least long enough to heal enough to be able to walk again. Because you can't, I, I can't imagine how this guy would have been walking after getting this injury, um, which in my opinion, of course, got to do a lot more research on it, um, indicates the existence of some kind of pack, of some kind of family structure 
um, might be humanizing them a little bit, thinking that they, they have some kind of mated pair or family or older generation taking care of the younger generation, something like that. But there is some evidence in this case to support a behavioral trend saying another animal was helping bring food to this animal that could not walk, could not hunt, could not take care of itself, and probably would have been easy prey if uh, something else hadn't been taken care of it. So that's, that's what I've been aiming towards more recently. Of course, I have to look at um, my proportions and statistics and got to, got to do all the math and numbers with this, um, which hasn't been happening, happening as much, putting off the, the original thesis, putting off this project a little bit, um, all because of, honestly, kids. Um, our programs, especially over this past summer, just became unbelievably popular. When I started 10 years ago, we had four interns um, my half of the summer. And I did my first full day dig, hosted my first full day dig about two weeks in my six weeks uh, program. We now have full 20 to 40 people going up to that, those dig sites every single day. Um, our interns are constantly working with kids and uh, with families. These are actually images um, from our kids digs and my interns working with them. Uh, this is another, a couple other programs we've run. Uh, Dinosaur Academy hosts for high schoolers um, coming out here, uh, learning about geology and paleontology, learning how we do our mapping, uh, learning about uh, plaster jacketing. Um, we have the regular dig for a days. Uh, the bottom left corner was actually a family on the last day one season found a three foot an almost exactly one meter long uh, humerus from a Camarasaurus um, found by a five-year-old. So they were really excited about that. And uh, we even host international groups. Um, it's been a couple years now, but we did host, uh, we have host groups from uh, China in the past. Um, they haven't been able to travel um, because of situations, um, but they have come out here and that's 30 kids at a time that come out uh, to learn about paleontology and geology and history. Um, and all that kind of stuff. And those expansions of programs um, have just kept us a whole lot busier. Um, we had our busiest, our, honestly, our busiest summer ever. Um, nearly every single kids dig that we had was full. 25 kids out there at once. Um, a bit overwhelming, uh, but overall really, really a lot of fun. Um, and that's a little bit of the delay with the research. I'm spending a lot more time doing these educational outreach programs, uh, working with other groups and all that kind of stuff. So while I'd love to be working on my allosaurus behavior and that kind of stuff, um, you, you can't deny the faces of those kids and how much fun they have. And uh, it's a lot of fun for me to see the fun that they have. So while I, uh, as a middle schooler, I said I wanted to be a teacher. I moved on to grad uh, college and grad school and it's like, no, I'm going to be a paleontologist. And it's like, well, I guess I'm a teacher again. So it's kind of reverted back um, to the original, the original design, um, which is perfectly fine with me because I like dinosaurs and these kids like talking about dinosaurs. So it works out pretty good. Um, so yeah, I hope y'all liked my presentation. I hope I didn't bore anyone too much. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll switch it over for whatever needs to happen next, including questions. Call me questions. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, Angela, thank you very much for a fascinating look at the Jurassic in Wyoming and the Pleistocene in uh, LA. I, I would never have connected those two things or thought that someone could do so, uh, so, so easily. So. Thank you, uh, and, and I just want to give a, the, the Dinosaur Center in Thermopolis is not just dinosaurs, it's not just digging, it's a museum with amazing fossils that cover the era of life before dinosaurs and even some of the time after dinosaurs. And so there's just, uh, it, is, it is well worth uh, many hours of a, of a visit. And, and I say this from personal experience. So let's get to some of the questions. Uh, Angela, 
10 to one ratio in La Brea, four to one ratio in Utah. What is the ratio in the natural world of a, in other words, what's the predator prey ratio that you would expect to find if there was no, uh, no other outside influence? Pretty much the exact opposite. Um, more or less a one to 10 predator to prey ratio. Um, looking out, even just outside, you'll see far more um, elk or deer or antelope or anything like that versus the mountain lions, wolves, and uh, uh, other predators around that, uh, that would eat them. Um, so just a, a typical um, predator prey ratio is actually one to 10 in that case. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when you did your analysis of bone sizes, is, is there any sexual dimorphism in these species? And, and if so, how did you figure that in? There definitely could be because we don't yet have a method to determine sexual dimorphism. Um, there really doesn't appear to be much among wolves. Um, even like among birds and crocodiles, there doesn't seem to be much, at least nothing distinctive, um, which were again, two of the groups I had to look at to make this comparison. Um, because we could not definitively say that there was sexual dimorphism among these animals, we couldn't take it into account. We just put everything together as a whole. We just, as much as it'd be nice to say, okay, these 30 are female allosaurs and these uh, 36 are male allosaurs, um, we could separate them that way. I could run even more statistical tests, um, which would be fun. Um, we, we can't determine that yet. So uh, unless there's a, a big difference, unless someone that uh, knows a little bit more about sexual dimorphism than I do goes and says, okay, this is how you tell them apart. I haven't figured out how to do that. So we just, we, we didn't even consider that um, in this case. We, we left that as a, as a uh, non-issue just to, to not overly complicate the problem. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the environment in in the Jurassic when the Morrison was being formed here uh, what kind of you know what, what kind what was the topography like what was the environment like and sort of and relate to that I mean I've walked around in our Morrison formation here and I've yet to find any fossils of anything yet in some areas you're tripping over them so could you elucidate that a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, so the Morrison formation is an overall very odd formation. We don't have any modern analogs to what exactly was going on during the late Jurassic to form the Morrison formation. Um, we have a massive, thick, huge, in some areas, thickness layers of mudstone shaley mudstone, limey mudstone, sandy mudstone, some sandstone, throw it all in there. You get these huge thick deposits, potentially hundreds of feet thick that range all the way from Canada down to Mexico, all over the place, just massively thick. But the idea is maybe they didn't form all at once. It wasn't one big event. It wasn't one steady thing. It was a, a migrating series of events um, between a vast series of lakes, uh, rivers, floodplains, um, even on our own dig sites. Um, we know almost for a fact, we, we pretty much know this, that the something interesting quarry was a edge of a lake bed, is the edge of a very large expansive lake. It looks slightly different from our other dig sites. Um, we have a more sandy uh, mudstone um, that we have actually been able to map out and see that it was definitely the curve in a river um, deposit. Um, at the same point, we're not typically finding um, shellfish or any kind of fish or anything that would live a predominantly aquatic life. Um, we, we aren't finding those in our dig sites. And yes, they are found at other dig sites. So you do have extensive lakes or rivers that these animals would have lived in. Um, but they don't happen here. 
um, which indicates that it was very seasonal, dry, wet, dry, wet, rainy season. Somewhere, the Morris Formation is a cross between the Mississippi River Valley and the African Savannah. <laughs> it's somehow a cross between those two rough environments. Um, you have the Mississippi River Valley producing these massive amounts of uh, deposits, moving this tons and tons of sediment. But then you also have something like the African savanna where the water drives up um, for a significant amount of time out of the year, um, which could lead to massive migrations, um, lead to large lakes forming and then disappearing, leading to eventually very large thick deposits of mud um, that you don't, you don't see as often um, uh, today. You just don't see that, that massive entire continent-wide um, depositional layers as much right now. Uh, in, in, in your opinion, the assemblage in Cleveland Lloyd, is, is this multiple events? Is this one sort of long event? Uh, you know, if you can, and I, and I realize there's no definitive answer here that it's an mm -hmm. ongoing question, but you've spent more time in the quarry than anyone else I know. So, um, actually, uh, my one of my advisors, Joe Peterson, uh, came out with a paper not long after or right before I finished my master's thesis. I can't remember now. It was right around that time. Came out with a paper that they used uh, photogrammetry. So they took thousands of pictures. So while I was taking thousands of phone measurements, they were taking thousands of pictures and were able to see through a 3D rendering that there are three distinct layers of bone in just what's left of the dig site today. So just looking at what they have exposed now, they could see a bottom layer with um, large um, partially oriented bone they could see a middle layer with much smaller pieces, also oriented, but in a slightly different direction. And then a third layer with, again, slightly larger bones oriented in another direction. So it does look like there were at least three main events and that there was some sort of water flow, a, a orientation, a way to orient these bones going in different directions. When the original studies were done, they said there was no orientation because they measured everything all at once. When they were able to split it up, kind of like talking about my, my different pits showing different distributions, when they could split it up into its own little packages, not cherry picking, uh, I'll, I'll say that not cherry picking, but actually there is a distinct layer down here, there's this distinct layer here, and there's a distinct layer at the top um, that shows at least three different events possibly flooding events from previous droughts, um, which is the predominating idea right now. Um, but yeah, there, there kind of has been, not definitive, but a little bit more evidence put forth by um, other researchers working in the same area saying that, yes, um, this, this it, he wanted more evidence to back up the idea that it's not a predator trap. And that's actually where the idea for my project came from was that we want to do this, but we don't know the statistics. Here's someone that might know the statistics. Let's give it to her and see what she can do from there. Um, so there's definite evidence to say it's not a predator trap. They wanted something more exact. They wanted the numbers to agree or disagree one way or the other. And uh, unfortunately, they disagreed with all of us and decided to confuse us instead. Uh, one of our uh, listeners wrote in and said when they were at the museum at the University of Utah, you got to vote on mm -hmm. sort of three mechanisms that mm -hmm. would account for this, you know, incredible uh, abundance of Allosaurus mm -hmm. in one place. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one would you vote for and, uh, and why? It was the, uh, the drought the drought assemblage. Um, very likely these animals, in, in my opinion, and based on uh, my research and seeing other ideas as well, is that the animals would migrate through the air areas, the giant chimerosaurs and diplodocus and apatosaurs would migrate back and forth in search of water. 
um, these relatively young allosaurs, because there was a predominantly younger population, um, couldn't travel as far as the others without water. So the idea is during this drought situation, this was the last or one of the last remaining sources of water. All of these allosaurs stayed gathered around it, um, competing for food, possibly how some of them died. Um, and surprisingly, though, we didn't find a whole lot of evidence of scavenging. Um, but based on that evidence, what I looked at, what researched, and what I've seen from uh, other advisors and all that kind of stuff, it does seem like the drought assemblage is the most likely um, culprit, pretty much. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the La Brea Tar Pits seems to be a very unique situation in the world. I, I don't know mm -hmm. of any other. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about sort of what are the real or the more common traps that mm -hmm. paleontologists investigate with La Brea being an outlier mm -hmm. kind of? Mm -hmm. um, so La Brea is kind of what we base a predator trap off of. So it's hard to leave it out as an outlier because it is kind of the basis <laughs> for that idea. Right. Um, outlier only in the sense that it's so unique. Yeah. And um, other, other pits would be uh, something like a, a, sorry, I've been talking too much. My brain stopped working there for a second. <laughs> <That's okay>. um, <laughs> we know the feeling, uh, trust me. <laughs> a, a sand trap something that they, quicksand, that's the word right. I'm looking for, quicksand, um, where they get in there, they get stuck in the quicksand. Um, if you look at uh, bentonite, the bentonite roads around here, when they get wet and they swell, something can easily get stuck in those kind of things. Um, 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 extra muddy pit or bog or something like that. Um, anything that can expand and contract um, could easily produce some kind of pit that catches things. Um, what are they? The, the bog people from uh, Europe that were trapped in a bog and their bodies were basically mummified is another version of that. Just not a, a predator trap because they didn't, they didn't stay exposed long enough to really ex ex attract predators or anything like that. Um, one of the ideas for future research, I would love to be able to go out and find all of the bone beds, all of the just piles of bones, um, similar to some stuff we have here. We actually have a dig site called bone bed um, and compare what makes something a, an actual predator trap. So we have the stereotypical, the, the uh, poster child for predator trap in the Brea Tar Pits. Um, but what about uh, Ghost Ranch in uh, New Mexico where they have tons of coelophysis um, all in these different things, and they're actually articulated. They're actually together. Is that a predator trap? Um, did they get trapped there, or was it another possibly likely drought assemblage? Were they eating each other? Were they cannibals? All this kind of stuff. What makes each situation special? Why, why were they here? Why did they get stuck? Why did they die here? Uh, kind of situation. And there, there's so many, um, I feel like, my, my coworker, Bill, always has 10,000 projects running around in his head, and I don't have that many, but I do have at least a couple dozen <laughs> that are running around in there that just, they're constantly competing with each other. What, what, what do you want to do right now? I was like, well, I, I want to travel the world and, and look at all these bone beds. And said, well, that's not going to happen in the middle of COVID, so pick something else for now. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, <clears throat> a lot of uh, animal traps such as caves and sinkholes, accumulate vast numbers of animals. Are they not predator traps because they, the ratio is closer to the 10 to one in favor of uh, herbivores, uh, specifically like trap cave in mm -hmm. uh, the Bighorns in yeah. Wyoming. And, and there's a number of others that, that they found, I think in Kentucky, there's some as well. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, they're not really considered predator traps. Again, you kind of need that predator to prey ratio. Um, you kind of have to have very specific situation where something gets stuck and attracts something else that accidentally gets stuck as well. Um, with natural trap caves, 
at least as far as my understanding goes, I, I honestly have not looked at it as much as I'd like to. Um, it was more of a, a coincidence, something getting chased and accidentally falls in. Um, more often than not, they die immediately. Um, so they don't have a chance to attract other things. Um, and it does so happen that sometimes they do survive and they can attract other things. But I feel like in that case, they're a little bit more cautious. You, you don't go immediately running right up to something um, with La Brea Tar Pits. They catch up to something, then they start to get too close and they get stuck because it doesn't look like a trap. With natural trap caves, you've got a big hole in the ground. You're not going to jump in there to get your prey. You'll fall in by accident. Um, so that, that makes it a, a little bit different in that case. Yeah. Uh, la last question. The, uh, in, at La Brea, the, the pit NA versus the other pits, uh, mm -hmm. can you talk about the differences there? Um, honestly, the overall difference is that the pit NA literally just stood for pit not available. It did not have a pit number. Um, so these could be from five different locations, or they could be from 500 different locations. They even might not be from actual pits. They might have just been collected off of the surface, um, which means maybe they were in a tar pit, maybe they weren't. Maybe it just so happens an animal died next to the tar pit or close to it or in the, the vicinity of it. Um, which could easily skew the data. We were expecting to see a decent amount of younger animals and a decent amount of older animals in these pits. We wanted to see like a, a double layer, a, a bimodal distribution. Um, and when you saw the pit in A, the pit number not available, it was a massive overall distribution ranges almost almost a box-like distribution um, of all this, of roughly the same number of each size of animal. Um, and that doesn't happen naturally. On a, on a regular basis, you will have more um, either younger and or middle-aged animals. Um, the reason we were expecting the younger and the older is because they're the ones that are gonna look for the easy meal the most. The, the middle-aged ones are going to be the ones that have seen that we, we've seen this trick before. We're not going over there. We'll, we'll stay away from this. One. We know that's a trap. Uh, we saw, we saw Frankie get stuck in there last week. We're not, we're not visiting that one again. Um, the young ones would be inexperienced enough not to know and to get stuck. The older ones would be desperate enough to try for the easy meal to keep, uh, to keep on living. Um, and that's what we were expecting to see. And most of what we saw kind of showed that skewed distribution. When we looked at the overall distribution and the group of animals from who knows where, that was when the distribution fell apart, when it didn't work, uh, didn't look like what we expected, um, which could mean that we're completely wrong in what we expect um, to happen. Um, or it could mean that uh, these, we, we have a skewed collection sample. So, the uh, providence is not known very well. Yes, exactly. Oh, well, Angela, thank you very much for a fascinating trip to the Jurassic and the Pleistocene uh, from our living rooms. We <laughs> look forward to getting you down here in person, and we really look forward to coming and seeing you in Thermopolis uh, mm -hmm. and your, your amazing collection up there. I just want to thank everyone who made our 20 programs this year possible, uh, especially Brent Schaefer, John Heberger, uh, Cynthia, Jennifer. You guys, it was an amazing job to pull this off in the year of COVID. And uh, I, I just want to, I just want to thank everyone for, for pulling it together. Uh, January 4th will be our next presentation. John Heberger will be speaking about the geology of Western Wyoming. I would say he's the most knowledgeable person I know on that subject. You will definitely learn something. On November 10th, we'll be going to the Idaho Natural History Museum for a field trip. This is a behind the scenes tour of a 
absolutely incredible collection. Uh, lots of Ice Age animals that whatever they find in the whole state of Idaho almost ends up there if it's not on private land. And uh, Leaf, the director, is extremely knowledgeable and I, I can't imagine anyone not enjoying and learning quite a bit from that field trip. So that's November 10th, uh, sign up with John Guslander. Thank you everyone. Uh, it's been, been a great year of Zoom and, and even a couple of in-persons. And uh, I, I see there's one new message. Oh, again, thanks for, from, from a number of our other members as well. So thank you, Angela. Thank you everyone else for making this possible. And hopefully we'll see 20 of you on November 10th. It is limited just because of the size of the museum. And uh, then we'll see everyone in January. Thank you and uh, good night. Thank you.